<laughs> they're, they're in the room. Okay. All right, Tony, it's, uh, it's April 3rd, 1974. Tell me what you were doing at the time. Well, I was working selling cars at uh, Wheatley Chevrolet. And uh, I was standing in the doorway of the shop and uh, just east of uh, uh, there is a state trooper having rented a house and he came by and he saw me standing in that door and he squalled and he said, you need to take cover, there's a tornado touchdown in Irvington that's headed this way. So I go in and call the house to make sure the babysitter takes care of the boys. Then I called her. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm in the showroom standing with uh, Lamar Allen, which was a Chevrolet dealer a long time ago. And we were just standing there talking, and uh, it got really black. And it uh, rained hard. I could see that GM sign out there really bending. And then it was over. And uh, we hadn't heard sirens going off but didn't expect anything and then a car pulls in and he was a GMAC representative that had been here in town waiting for a guy and he came in and the windows were all out of his car and he couldn't even hardly talk he said your town is gone and I said what are you talking about he said your town is gone so Henry Penn one of the mechanics there was getting ready to test drive a car and I said take me to, through town and we got to where the big old is right now. And you look across and there's nothing. For the Baptist church and all that is nothing. I got out of the car, ran down the hill, went behind the old library and down to where she was. When I got to downtown Brandenburg, <clears throat> it looked like a bomb had gone off. I made a brick out in the road and piled up and all the buildings. Every place I grew up in was gone. And uh, I saw that she was okay. And uh, we had a, I had a pickup truck there that I'd just taken down there at lunchtime mm -hmm. to change cars with her, and it was my demo, and the, all the tires were flat on it, and all I mean, it was crazy. So once she was okay, she started. We started looking for people and helping them. Okay, and uh, mm -hmm. there was a older lady that had a drugstore, Rose Grinnell, so we could hear her. We dug her out and put her on a door and carried her and put her in the back of that truck, and we'd take her up to the clinic where the triage was and come back. And there was others there that didn't make it, I know. So once I got through there, they said they needed help out here at the, on the fairground road, which is right in front of the courthouse. And I, this is where I was raised, right here where the courthouse is, and I knew all those people, you know. And uh, it was gone. I mean, those little houses were just concrete slabs, and that's all was left of the slabs. And uh, it was kind of weird because they were, were trying to find people and help them, and they... <clears throat> the Army had helicopters in here, and the, the state troopers were helping them, and we were helping carrying people up there, and this guy was asking me what I wanted to do with this or that, and I said, what are you asking me? Well, I had changed my shirt to come down and help that, and I'd been out of the Army only four years, and I had a fatigue shirt on with sergeant stripes, and he thought I was in charge, and I said, I'm not in charge anymore. <laughs> but anyway, that was how that was going, everybody was helping everybody. And um, there was a family of the uh, Columbus Skillman. He and his, his wife and daughter lived together and they worked, at, I mean, they were really, really great people. They couldn't find them. So Harry Jones was a friend of mine. Harry's passed now, but uh, I said, let's go looking for him. So we came up here where the courthouse is, my own home place. It was fields and honeysuckles and patches and all. And, we looked and we found them, and they, you know, that's 500 yards from where their house was, and that's they dropped them one, two, and three, you know, and wow. that's uh, that'll always be there. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, I bet. Um, you referenced Amanda. If you reference her, maybe give say her name. That way, when we when we're playing this back, we know who you're referencing. Okay, you keep pointing over here. Her. Okay, I'm just saying. Okay, if I you, got you. If you get, we're gonna make it look good regardless. All right. Um, okay, so we kind of that was a ton of information. We could probably dissect what you just said and probably blow <laughs> blow it up. Um, so I want to go back real quick. Tell me what you remember. Uh, the feeling that day. Did you have any idea that there was going to be weather? What did it feel like outside? No, we. Uh, I don't think you had the warnings then that you do now. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, no one thought that there'd be a tornado like that. We didn't know what a tornado was. 
you know, and how devastating it can be. We know now, but maybe we, we take better warnings now than we did then. But I don't uh, know that what we could have done any differently, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, had it happened maybe 30 minutes later, it would have caught all this, this traffic coming from Olin at that time, chemical plant with all the people leaving there. You know, it could have been really, really bad there too, you know. So it was right after 4 o'clock. At 4.30 they got off work and that could have been really, really bad then. Or if it had been earlier, it would have caught the school buses on the road with all the kids in it. Right. So. You said you took a call from Irvington. Pardon? You said you got warning from Irvington. I got a warning from the, the state policeman when he stopped. He said that the tornado was in Irvington at that time. So he was relating that to me. It said it was close, you know, so he do something fast. How far away is Irvington? It's 10 miles. Okay, so you got about 10. And it when it touched down in Irvington, it didn't come off the ground. It all the way through Brandenburg across the river. Right. So when did it become real to you that when I topped that hill, it, when they let me out of the big old store and I saw across in town and it was gone, that's real. What was going through your head at the time? Uh, I don't know. To get downtown, that's what I did. You know, I was 24, 25 years old. I could run then. I'd have to take a cab now. <laughs> <laughs> An Uber. Yeah. <laughs> um, when did you find out that your family was okay and how did you feel when you got that news? I felt great when I got down there and saw that the mess downtown was in and she was fine. I was great, you know. And I, I knew that side of the town wasn't hit where the boys were because I've been there, you know, and uh, they were fine. Good. Good. Um, you mentioned some of the rescuing. Can you go into a little more detail? You mentioned the one lady that you pulled from yeah, the Rose rubble. Grinnell. Can you describe maybe okay, a little yeah. more detail? You know, she was in a <clears throat> her uh, drugstore there that everybody went into, and they were just piled on top of her. And, and she was an elderly lady at the time, pretty tough, and we were able to dig her out and put her on a, a, a door and, and put her in the back of that truck. I can't, there was like three we did that with, and uh, <clears throat> I can't remember the other ones, but it was she just sticks out in my mind that that was the one I couldn't believe she was saved because just across the road there were some buildings just like that that people died in. Right. Um, what else do you remember during that? Must have been chaos. It was chaos and, and it is going through your mind, how are you ever gonna clean this up? You know, this is my town. Yeah. You know, I delivered papers as a kid to all these people, you know, and it's gone. Mm -hmm. It'll never be the same. And uh, it hasn't been, you know, it mm -hmm. changed the complexity of this town forever, whether good, bad, or whatever, but, you know, it was centralized downtown, the courthouse, you know, there was businesses down there, there was a theater down there, there was, you know, and it's all gone, you know, and it was never going to come back, and it it struggled, you know, I think it probably, when the courthouse moved from downtown, that probably moved everybody's attention to come out from downtown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there was a, uh, I guess, memorial at the high school, correct? Well, see, both funeral homes were tore up, so they were having funerals in, in schools. And uh, St. John's School, the base for that was one of the funeral homes used that. And uh, Hager Funeral Home, they were able to use a back building behind their funeral home, fixed it up, and they used that. And that, you know, that made it, <clears throat> that made it tough, you know, for families, mm -hmm. it did. Uh, you know, they had memorials at the, at the high school, and uh, it was, uh, I think everybody was still in shock at the time, you know. Yeah. And, and, it, and as Amanda said in her interview, you know, it's, it's like it's, that's a pinpoint that this happened before the tornado or after the tornado. And that's just the way it's always going to be in the lives that we're, we led here and went through that. And it's it's a, a central part for us. Mm -hmm. So all these years later, looking back at that, what are your takeaways? Is the town ready for another disaster like that? Well, I hope not. <laughs> I hope we'll get another disaster. But I think it's a lot more efficient than what we were, you know, because they've, they've seen to that. And uh, I think communication is a lot better, 
you know, you can get on Facebook or whatever, somebody's on it all the time, they're taking telling warnings and all of it. In that day, you didn't have any warning, you know, it was just there, it was on you. And, and I know there's times that probably a tornado can sneak up like that again, you know, they can warn you about it, but they don't know if it's going to pop up. But as Amanda said, it's, you know, she was, she's really been alert on storms, and she has, and she kept us all alert on them, you know. I didn't, we didn't take it for granted. We don't. How do you think uh, the community reacted? Um, you know, the community was one way before April 3rd, 1974. And in the days immediately following, how do you contrast the... the Everybody the, the, jumped in. I mean, the, the people that had businesses, the contractors and so forth, had the, had the uh, backhoes and tractors and so forth, they jumped in. You know, they helped clean these streets up and helped, you know, it was, uh, it was amazing, some of them. And some of them had already lost, had lost their business and all, they piled in helping everybody else. You know, that's just how tight-knit it was here at the time. Uh, you know, there's, uh, the population has increased here, and mm -hmm. uh, there's still people here that can remember this, you know, but mm -hmm. there's, you know, been a lot of people that have passed away since that time, you know, that were, yeah. helped a lot, helped other people. Right. Well, Brandenburg didn't receive a warning, not much of one at all. Um, because of what happened in Brandenburg, though, um, spoke to a forecaster that was working for the National Weather Service, said because of Brandenburg, because of what had happened earlier in southern Indiana, Louisville got a 30-minute warning. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it was almost like Brandenburg was the sacrifice to help other communities downstream, including Louisville. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know how much warning you would take if you hadn't experienced one of these. You know, they say, well, a tornado was hitting Louisville and it was coming our way. Would we be as responsive as we would now because we already experienced it? Probably not. But I'd say now, yeah, you're going to respond to it now. And, well, and that's what we are. What about the kids, though? Nowadays, you know, this is 50 years ago. You know, the kids nowadays, how would they relate to what you described and what occurred on April 3rd? Can they relate to that? How does... How does anyone relate to something they haven't experienced? You know, they just hear about it. You don't want them to experience it. But, you know, you're trying to tell your kids about things, and sometimes they've just got to experience it for it to happen and sink in. Right. So I don't know. You can put all the warnings you want to, I, but will they really accept that? I don't know. Yeah. I kind of think if we get some youth to watch this video we're producing, they may have a little bit of a different response when a warning comes Well, I think... If they hear your testimony, if they hear the testimony, uh, you know, from, from the members of the community that were there at the time. I just hope that some of, the, some of these kids that have grown up now, they're not kids anymore, uh, that this story has been told to them by their families that lost people, that lost a lot of, and they experienced this and lost their friends and so forth, that they have told this story through the years. So they know that this happened to Brian Burke and it can't happen again. Yeah. You know, so always be aware. But, you know, count your blessings every day. Right. Right. All right. Any final thoughts, Tony? Well, I just, you know, grew up in this town. Uh, and like I said, I delivered papers to everybody that down through there, the ones here by the courthouse and all. And the, I knew all these people, you know. <clears throat> it was a tragic thing. But I think we grew from that, knowing mm -hmm. that it... Uh, Life is precious, and uh, if we can make it just as good here now, but just get close to your neighbor and close to your, your town and be willing to help when things happen like this. Yeah, certainly it looks like Brandenburg did that. Yeah, yeah, they did. Okay. Thanks, Tony. All right. I appreciate it, buddy. No problem. Thank you. <clears throat>